Assalamu alaikum friends, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to talk about antiprotozoal drugs. If you haven't watched my video on antiparasitic drugs, watch that one first and you will have a good grip on this video. But prior to starting the lecture, I'd like to tell you guys that these videos are meant for educational purposes. Things and treatments may change with time. If I get wrong or miss anything, your input is always welcomed in the comments section. Grab a pen and a notepad and let's get started. Antiprotozoal drugs. These work against the protozoal infections such as amoebiasis, giardiasis, trichomoniasis, cryptosporidiosis. Protozoal diseases are less easily treated than bacterial infections and many of the antiprotozoal drugs cause serious toxic effects in the host, host being the human beings. Most antiprotozoal drugs are prohibited in pregnancy because of their toxic effects. Lecture outline. I have introduced you guys to the antiprotozoal drugs. Now we are going to talk about their classification. Classification includes amoebicides, anti-malarial drugs, anti-trypanosomal drugs, anti-leash manual, anti-troxoplasmosal, and anti giardial drugs. This is a quick table. Don't get scared of it. It's quite easy. Let's start with the drugs that are effective against amoebiasis. I've got a mnemonic for that. It is I'm a tiny CD player. I have written A in the uppercase letter which shows that these are the drugs that work against amoebiasis. Then I've got I am. I is for iodoquinone, M is for metronidazole, then tiny is for tinidazole, C is for chloroquine and D for dehydroamethine in CD, and player has got P in it that is for paramomycin. Let's start talking about them and then we'll look at the other drugs that work against other parasites. Amoebicides. The drugs that work against amoebiasis are also termed as amoebicides or anti-amoebic drugs. These are the drugs that work against amoebic dysentery or liver amoebiasis. We also term it as hepatic amoebiasis. These therapeutic agents uh, for amoebiasis are classified into luminal, systemic and mixed, which includes both luminal and systemic. Luminal amoebicides act on a parasite in the lumen of the bowel, the intestine. It treats the intestinal amoebiasis. While the systemic amoebicides are effective against amoebas in the liver and the intestinal wall, it treats extra intestinal amoebiasis. Mixed amoebicides, these are effective against both the luminal and systemic forms of the disease. Let's look at this diagram. This is a trophozoid, these ones too, and these are the cysts, right? Systemic amoebicides work against the amoebas that affect the intestinal wall, like the trophozoids there, and the liver, like this trophozoid there. And luminal amoebicides work against those forms of parasite that affect the bowel only. This is the cyst. And th these are the trophozoids. So these are the two forms that affect the intestines. So luminal amoebicides work against that one. If we look at the mixed amoebicides, these work against both the forms. The ones that are responsible for causing the, the infection in lumen of the intestine and also in the intestinal wall and the liver. The systemic amoebicides include chloroquine and dehydroamethine. Remember that. Mixed amoebicides include metronidazole and tinidazole, while the luminal amoebicides include iodoquinol and paramomycin. Let's start with the metronidazole. It is a nitroamidazole and is a mixed amoebicide. It is given in combination with luminal amoebicides. It is used for the treatment of amoebiasis, but let me tell you something else about this drug, it is also used in the treatment of infections caused by Giardia lamblia, Trichomonas vaginalis, and some bacteria. Mechanism of action. The nitro group of metronidazole is able to serve as an electron acceptor, forming reduced cytotoxic compounds that bind to proteins and DNA, resulting in the death of Entamoeba histolytica. There are two terminologies that are frequently used in pharmacology. One is pharmacokinetics and the other one is pharmacodynamics. What is pharmacokinetics? What body does to the drug and what drug does to the body? This is referred to as pharmacodynamics. Let's talk about the pharmacokinetics of metronidazole. Metronidazole is completely and rapidly absorbed after oral administration. So, so here we got to know that it is administered orally. It, it distributes well throughout the body tissues and fluids. 
Therapeutic levels can be found in vaginal and seminal fluids, saliva, breast milk, and CSF. Metabolism of drug depends on the hepatic oxidation of the metronidazole side chain by mixed function oxidase, followed by glucuronidation, therefore concomitant treatment with inducers of the cytochrome P450, such as phenobarbital, enhances the rate of metabolism. And inhibitors such as semitidine prolong the plasma half-life of the metronidazole. The drug accumulates in the patients with severe hepatic disease. The parent drug and its metabolites are excreted in the urine. Adverse effects of metronidazole. There are two types of effects or we can say events that occur after a drug is administered. One is adverse and the other one is side. So what are adverse effects or adverse events? These are unintended pharmacologic events or effects that occur when a medication is administered correctly, while a side effect is a secondary unwanted effect that occurs due to drug therapy. The adverse effects caused by metronidazole include nausea, vomiting, epigastric distress, abdominal cramps. An unpleasant metallic taste is commonly experienced. Other effects include oral monolysis. It can be due to an infection of the mouth that is mainly the yeast infection. It is also termed as thrush. And rarely neurotoxicity, which include dizziness, vertigo, and numbness or paresthesia. If metronidazole is taken with alcohol, a disulfiram-like reaction can occur. The next mix amoebicide is tinidazole. It is a second-generation nitroimidazole. It is, as I've mentioned, a mixed amoebicide and is similar to metronidazole in spectrum of activity, absorption, adverse effects, and drug interactions. It is used for the treatment of amoebiasis, amoebic liver abscess, giardiasis, and trichomoniasis. Tinidazole is as effective as metronidazole but is more expensive. Alcohol consumption should be avoided during its therapy. Now let's talk about the aluminal amoebicides. The first one in the list is iodoquinol. It is a halogenated 8-hydroxyquinolone. It is effective against luminal trophozoites and cysts. Adverse effects of iodoquinol include rash, diarrhea, and dose-related peripheral neuropathy, including airway optic neuritis. Long-term use of this drug should be avoided. The second one in the list is paromomycin. It is an aminoglycoside antibiotic. It is effective against only luminal forms of Entamoeba histolytica because it is not significantly absorbed from the GI tract. Paramomycin is directly amoebicidal and also exerts its anti-amoebic actions by reducing the population of intestinal flora. Gastrointestinal distress and diarrhea are the principal adverse effects. Time to talk about the systemic amoebicides. The first one is chloroquine. It is used in combination with metronidazole or as a substitute for one of the nitroimidazoles in the case of intolerance to treat amoebic liver abscesses. It eliminates trophozoites and liver abscesses, but it is not useful in treating luminal amoebiasis. Therapy should be followed with a luminal amoebicide. Chloroquine is also effective against the treatment of malaria. It's really common. The next one to discuss in systemic amoebicides is dehydroimidine. It is an alternative agent for the treatment of amoebiasis. It acts by inhibiting the protein synthesis by blocking the chain elongation. There are two routes of administration of that drug. One is IM, the intramuscular, and the second one is IV. Uh, the reason behind these routes is that it is an irritant when taken orally. Adverse effects of this drug include pain at the site of injection, nausea, cardiotoxicity, um, for example, arrhythmias and congestive heart failure, neuromuscular weakness, dizziness and rash can also occur. Okay, now we are done with amoebicides. Let's start talking about the anti-malarial drugs. These are the drugs that work against malaria. Malaria is an acute infectious disease caused by five species of protozoal genus, Plasmodium. It is transmitted to humans through the bite of a female Anopheles mosquito. 
And the classic presentation of malaria begins with headache, fatigue, which is followed by fever, chills, and sweats. The five types are the five species of Plasmodium are Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium malaria, and Plasmodium nolisi. If you want to know more about Plasmodium, I've got detailed video on Plasmodium. Its link is in the description or in the top right corner. The therapeutic agents for malaria are classified into two. These are based on the location of the parasite in the human body. One is the erythrocytic and the second one is exoerythrocytic. Erythrocyte is actually the term used for red blood cells. So erythrocytic is referring to the drug that will be acting against the form of the parasite that is affecting the red blood cell. And the exoerythrocytic is referring to the drug that will be working against the form of the parasite that is outside the red blood cells, maybe in the blood or maybe in the liver. Erythrocytic acts on a parasite in the red blood cells, as I told you earlier, and exoerythrocytic is effective against the plasmodium in the liver. As we now know, what are erythrocytic and what are exoerythrocytic drugs? Let's talk about the drugs that work against the dormant forms. These drugs are effective against the dormant forms of the plasmodium. These are the forms um, which we actually call the hypnozoids of plasmodium vivax and ovale that are in dormant forms. There are some drugs that work against gametocytes. These drugs are termed as the drugs that work against gametocytic forms and these are effective against the gametocytes in the infected red blood cells. Okay, let's talk about this diagram. Here you can see this is the liver. And these are the red blood cells. And these are the gametocytes. So the drugs that are effective against the gametocytic forms of the parasite, the plasmodium here, is the primoquine. And the drugs that are effective against the hypnozoid form only in the plasmodium vivax and plasmodium ovale case is also the primoquine. And these hypnozoids um, remain dormant in the liver. And the drugs that are effective against primary liver exoerythrocytic form include etoaquone or progonal and primoquine. And the drugs that work against the erythrocytic form include artemisinin, etoaquone or progonal, chloroquine, mefloquine, pyrimethamine and quinine. Let's talk about all of them. The first one in the list is primoquine. It is an 8 amino quinolone. Its route of administration is oral. That's why we can say it is oral anti-malarial drug. It is the only drug that prevents relapses. You know what are relapses? Relapses actually means the occurrence of the disease after its recovery. Asmodium species may develop resistance against that drug. Mechanism of action of primaquine. It acts as oxidants that severely disrupt the metabolic processes of plasmodial mitochondria. The metabolites are responsible for the schizontocidal action as well as for hemolysis and methemoglobinemia encountered as toxicities. Let's talk about its pharmacokinetics. Primaquine is well absorbed after oral administration and is not concentrated in the tissues. It is rapidly oxidized to many compounds, primarily the deaminated drug. The drug is minimally excreted in urine. Adverse effects of the primaquine include drug-induced hemolytic anemia, abdominal discomfort, and methemoglobinemia. It is prohibited in pregnancy. The next one in the list is chloroquine. It is a most common anti-malarial drug. Chloroquine is a synthetic 4-aminoquinoline. Its route of administration is oral. It is used in prophylaxis of malaria for the travel areas and is also effective in extraintestinal amoebiasis, as we've discussed earlier. Plasmodium falciparum has developed resistance against chloroquine and it is less effective against Plasmodium vivax malaria. Let's talk about the mechanism of action of chloroquine. The action of chloroquine on the formation of hemozoin by Plasmodium species. Let's start with the point number one. The parasite digests the host cell's hemoglobin to obtain essential amino acids. Here you can see this is the hemoglobin with, with its heme there. Hemoglobin has got two things in it, number one heme and number two amino acids. As we've talked that the parasite digests the host cell's hemoglobin to obtain essential amino acids. Then what happens? The process releases large amounts of heme which is toxic to the parasite. Then parasite does what? 
To protect itself, the parasite ordinarily polymerizes the heme to non-toxic hemozoin, which is sequestered in the parasite's food vacuole. Here you can see this is hemozoin. Heme, heme is converted to hemozoin. This is the normal process. When chloroquine comes into play, it inhibits this conversion of heme to hemozoin. Then heme gets accumulated there, which is toxic to the parasite. Chloroquine prevents the polymerization to hemozoin. The accumulation of the heme results in the lysis of both the parasite and the red blood cells. Pharmacokinetics has got four steps in it, which I forgot to mention earlier. Number one is absorption. Number two is distribution. Number three is metabolism. And the final fourth step is excretion. Pharmacokinetics of chloroquine. Chloroquine is rapidly and completely absorbed following oral administration. The drug has a very large volume of distribution and concentrates in erythrocytes, liver, spleen, kidney, lung, melanin-containing tissues, and leukocytes. It persists in erythrocytes because it is going to cause damage to the parasite who is present in the erythrocytes. That The drug also penetrates the CNS, the central nervous system, and traverses the placenta. Chloroquine is dealkylated by hepatic mixed function oxidase system and some metabolic products retain antimalarial activity. Both parent drug and metabolites are excreted predominantly in urine. Adverse effects. Adverse effects are minimally low at prophylactic doses. At higher doses, gastrointestinal upset, pruritus, headaches, and blurred vision may occur. A retinal toxicity, discoloration of nail beds and mucous membranes, and prolongation of QT interval. The next drug in the list is the combination of etovacone and progonol. Etovacone is hydroxynaphthoquinone. It inhibits mitochondrial processes. Progonol's active triazine metabolite, psychogonol. It prevents DNA synthesis. The combination of etovacone and progonol is effective for chloroquine-resistant strains of Plasmodium falciparum, and it is used in the prevention and treatment of malaria for travelers from outside malaria endemic areas. Etovacone progonol is not routinely used in endemic areas due to propensity for emergence of high-level resistance. This combination is given with food or milk to enhance absorption. Common adverse effects include nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, headache, diarrhea, anorexia, and dizziness. The next drug in the list is malfoquine. It is a 4-methanolquinoline. It is related to quinine, and it is also administered orally. It is structurally related to quinine, which is an effective drug for prophylaxis from all plasmodia. And for the treatment when used in combination with an artemisinin derivative for infections caused by multidrug resistant forms of Plasmodium falciparum. Pharmacokinetics. It is well absorbed and distributed widely. It has a long half-life of 20 days. And it undergoes extensive metabolism and is excreted in feces. Adverse reactions at high doses range from nausea, vomiting and dizziness to disorientation, hallucinations and depression. Because of potential for neuropsychiatric reactions, mefloquine is usually reserved for the treatment of malaria when other agents cannot be used. ECG or electrocardiogram abnormalities in cardiac arrest are possible if mefloquine is taken concurrently with quinine or quinidine. So the next drug in the list is quinine. It is an alkaloid originally isolated from the bark of cinchona tree. And it is used for severe infections and chloroquine-resistant malarial strains. And its route of administration is oral. It is given in combination with doxycycline, tetracycline, and clindamycin. Mechanism of action. It interferes with heme polymerization, resulting in the death of the erythrocytic form of the plasmodial parasite. When quinine is taken orally, it is well distributed throughout the, the body. The major adverse effects of quinine in synchronism, that is a syndrome causing nausea, vomiting, tinnitus, and vertigo. The use of quinine is stopped when hemolytic anemia occurs. Next drug in the line is artemisinin. Artemisinin is derived from the sweet wormwood plant. Artemisinin and its derivatives are recommended first-line agents for the treatment of multidrug-resistant plasmodium falciparum malaria. Addition of another antimalarial agent or artemisinin-based combination therapy, ACT, it is recommended to prevent the development of resistance. 
One orally available ACT includes a tablet with artimether co-formulated with lumifantarin and is used for the treatment of uncomplicated malaria. Lumifantarin is anti-malarial drug similar in action to quinine or mefloquine. Artisanate may be combined with sulfadoxine, pyrimethamine, mefloquine, clindamycin or others. Artimethanin is available in following routes, um, oral, rectal, intermuscular and intravenous. Mechanism of action. The anti-malarial action of artimethanin derivatives involves the production of free radicals resulting from cleavage of the drug's endoperoxide bridge by heme iron in the parasite's food vacuole. Adverse effects. These include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. High doses may also cause prolongation of the QT interval. Hypersensitivity reactions and rash can also occur. Next up is pyrimethamine. Pyrimethamine is a drug that is used to treat toxoplasmosis along with malaria. It is available in fixed dose combination. The combination of pyrimethamine with sulfadoxine and sulfonamide can also be used to treat certain diseases like its combination with sulfadoxine is used to treat toxoplasma gondii infections. Resistance to this combination has developed so it is given with other agents such as artimesin and derivatives. Mechanism of action. It inhibits plasmodial dihydrofolate reductase that is required for the synthesis of tetrahydrofolate, a cofactor needed for the synthesis of nucleic acids. It acts as a blood schizonticide and a strong sporonticide when the mosquito ingests it with the blood of the human host. Adverse effects of this drug include megaloblastic anemia. Now let's look at antitrypanosomal drugs. These drugs work against uh, trypanosomiasis, mean these are effective against trypanosomiasis. Trypanosomiasis is the infection caused by two species of trypanosoma. One is trypanosoma cruzi that is responsible for causing Shag's disease or which is also called as American sleeping sickness and another species is trypanosoma brucei. It has got two more in it, trypanosoma brucei gambiensi and trypanosoma Brucia rhodesiensi. These two are responsible for causing African sleeping sickness. Therapeutic agents for trypanosomiasis are classified into American sleeping sickness and African sleeping sickness agents. So the drugs that are used for American sleeping sickness agents, um, the first one in the list is nifertimox. Nifertimox is a nitroaromatic compound and it is used to treat trypanosoma cruzi infection because this organism is responsible for causing American sleeping sickness. It in combination with eflornithine can also be used to treat trypanosoma brucei gambiensi infections. The route of administration of this drug is oral. Mechanism of action. Being a nitroaromatic compound, nifertimox undergoes reduction and eventually generates intracellular oxygen radicals, such as superoxide radicals and hydrogen peroxides. These highly reactive radicals are toxic to toxoplasma cruzi. Pharmacokinetics. Nifertimox is administered orally, as I mentioned, so it is extensively metabolized, and the metabolites um, are excreted mainly in the urine. Adverse effects are common following chronic administration, particularly among elderly. Major toxicities include hypersensitivity reactions like anaphylaxis and dermatitis, and gastrointestinal problems that may be severe enough to cause weight loss. Peripheral neuropathy is relatively common, and headache, dizziness may also occur. Next drug is benzimidazole. It is also a nitrometazole derivative with a mechanism of action similar to nifotimox. It tends to be better tolerated than nifotimox for the treatment of Chag's disease. Adverse effects include dermatitis, peripheral neuropathy, insomnia, and anorexia. Now we are going to look, have a closer look at the drugs that are used to treat African sleeping sickness, right? The first one in the list is pentamidine. Pentamidine is used to treat early stages of the disease. It is also used to treat pneumocystis gerovechia infection and leishmaniasis. The routes of administration of this drug are intramuscular and intravenous. Mechanism of action. The toxoplasma brucia is responsible for causing African sleeping sickness. So this parasite concentrates pentamidine by an energy-dependent high-affinity uptake system. This drug interferes with parasite synthesis of RNA, DNA, phospholipids, and proteins. Pharmacokinetics. The drug after absorption is distributed widely and concentrates in liver, kidney, adrenal, spleen, and lungs. The drug is not metabolized and is excreted very slowly in urine. Adverse effect. Serious renal dysfunction may occur, which is reversible on discontinuation. Other adverse reactions include hyperkalemia, hypertension, pancreatitis, ventricular arrhythmias, 
and hyperglycemia. Now, suramin comes into play. Suramin is a used primarily in the early stages of the disease. As it is too reactive and it inhibits many enzymes, a test dose is given prior to giving this drug. And its route of administration is IV, intravenous. Mechanism of action. It is very reactive and inhibits many enzymes, especially those involved in energy metabolism, which appears to be the mechanism correlated with trypanocidal activity. It binds to plasma proteins and does not penetrate the BBB. You know what is BBB? It is blood-brain barrier. Um, and it has a long elimination life, so now we are talking about pharmacokinetics. Um, its uh, half-life is... Um, greater than 40 days and is mainly excreted unchanged in urine. Adverse effects include nausea, vomiting, shock and loss of consciousness. Acute urticaria, blephritis and neurologic problems such as paresthesia, photophobia and hyperesthesia of the hands and feet. Renal insufficiency may occur but tends to resolve with discontinuation of treatment. Acute hypersensitivity reactions may occur. Let's talk about melarsoprol. It is a trivalent arsenical compound and is the only medicine for the treatment of late stages of the disease of the African sleeping sickness. Some resistance has been developed against that drug. Its route of administration is intravenous, the IV. Mechanism of action. The drug reacts with sulfhydryl groups of various substances including enzymes in both the organism and host. Adequate trypanocidal concentrations appear in the CSF, the cerebral spinal fluid, making milarsoprol the agent of choice in the treatment of trypanosoma brucei rhodesiensi, which rapidly invades the CNS. The host readily oxidizes milarsoprol to a relatively non-toxic pentavalent arsenic compound. Pharmacokinetics the drug has a very short half-life and is rapidly excreted in urine. Adverse effects of melarsoprol include reactive encephalopathy, peripheral neuropathy, hypertension, hepatotoxicity, albuminuria, hypersensitivity reactions, febrile reactions, and hemolytic anemia, especially in G6PD deficient patients. The last drug in the list of African sleeping sickness agents is eflornithine. It is used to treat late stages of the disease and is an irreversible inhibitor of ornithine decarboxylase, the OD. It is less toxic than melarsoprol. Its route of administration is IV. Mechanism of action. Inhibition of the ornithine decarboxylase holds the production of polyamines in the parasite, thereby leading to cessation of cell division. Adverse effects of eflornithine include um, anemia, seizures, and temporary hearing loss. Now we are going to have a look at the drugs that work against leishmaniasis, and these are termed as anti-leishmanial drugs. They are used for the treatment of leishmaniasis, and the choice of drug depends on the species of the leishmania. There are three manifestations of leishmania, the cutaneous, mucocutaneous, and visceral. If you've missed any of my leishmania videos, find their links in the description. Wizard leishmaniasis is treated parenterally with amphotericin B and pentavalent antimonals, which include sodium styroglucone and maglumin antimony with pentamidine and paramomycin. Wizard cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis are treated orally with meltifosin. We'll be looking at sodium styrogluconate and meltifosin. The pentavalent antimonal sodium styrogluconate is a prodrug, which is reduced to the active trivalent antimonal compound and resistance has developed against that drug and its route of administration is still the same that is intravenous, the IV. Pharmacokinetics, because it is not absorbed after oral administration, that's why it is given parenterally and it is distributed in extravascular compartment. Metabolism is minimal and the drug is excreted in urine. Adverse effects include injection site pain, pancreatitis, elevated liver enzymes, arthralgias, myalgias, GI upset. Multifosin is the first orally active drug for visceral leishmaniasis and can also treat cutaneous and mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. That's why I've written that it is used for the treatment of all the three manifestations of leishmaniasis. It is a teratogenic drug and it should be avoided in pregnancy. Mechanism of action, uh, mel meltifosin appears to interfere with phospholipids and sterols in the parasitic cell membrane to induce apoptosis. Adverse effects include nausea and vomiting. Antitoxoplasmal cell drugs is our next topic and these are the drugs that are used for the treatment of toxoplasmosis. Treatment of choice is the combination of sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine or pyrimethamine with clindamycin, trimethoprim, and sulfamethoxazole.
Leucovore is commonly administered to protect against folate deficiency. Anti-giardial drugs. Giardial lamblia is the most commonly diagnosed intestinal parasite. It has two life cycle stages, the binucleate trophozoite with four flagella and the drug-resistant four-nucleate cyst. The treatment of choice for um, the infections caused by Giardia lamblia is oral metronidazole for five days. An alternative is a single dose of tenidazole. So metronidazole, tenidazole are the anti-giardial drugs. Um, if we are giving a tenidazole, so we should give a single dose. When we are going to look at nitazoxanide, three-day course orally is given for that. And uh, paramomycin is given in pregnancy. And also we can give albendazole as it is an anti-helminthic drug. But still, this is used to treat the infection caused by Giardia lamblia. That is called Giardia acids. And that's it for today's video. I hope you found this video helpful. If you guys have got any suggestions, feel free to leave them below in the comments. And also, if you want to connect with me on my socials, I've got my Instagram, I've got my Twitter, and I do upload vlogs. And I'll catch you soon. Till then, assalamu alaikum.